So I woke up this morning, looked out my hotel window, it's still flat. It's amazing what you can see from the sixth floor. Except I'm staying on seven. I don't know how that happened. Okay. What a crazy day yesterday was and a crazy night last night. How many of you got arrested? Look around. There's people missing. Something went down last night. Hey, oh, wait, I got to do this. This is the coolest thing. Robbie just showed me this. In like 1983, Atari 2600 was the coolest thing ever. It just got beat. Let me do this. Bear with me. MC Hummer. You should see the pants I had on last night. Hold on. I got to go to the app. Watch this. Loading, loading. I got to get rid of this iPhone 6. There it goes. So Johnny Armstrong just took a picture. You're up there, Johnny. Can we put the, uh, the app on live? Okay. Now, is that the app there? Okay, now hold on a second, because it says, what's on my mind? And I'm going to do this. Let's go like this. Wait, flip the camera. Okay. Everybody, everybody say cheese. And then watch the screen right after this. Ready? That's okay. That's what we're doing to the world. There we go. What we'll, what we'll tell people is that's actually posted from like Hawaii. What happened? I need the app up. We just missed it. See, we're up there already. So as you're sitting here, you can be taking pictures and it goes up on the app. This is kind of cool. So some, and now it looks like the fish is getting ready to bite my head. And she's laughing about it. All right. We've got a bunch of announcements here this morning and um, not too crazy, but some cool stuff here today. We've got a big panel that's going to be up here, obviously. Tonight, we've got the Flatties, the FIBA Awards, the Flat Earth Video Awards will be uh, this afternoon. Um, I just got to say, we made the news last night locally. I don't know if you guys saw that. And I, I you know, some people say, any attention is good attention. That's so true. But isn't it funny how you know everyone got treated very well with a lot of dignity and respect yesterday. But yes, of course, we got attention. But in the opening line, you can see how the media does have their own intentions. The first line she said, if you guys hadn't seen it, for those of you watching live or on the stream or later on, the first line that was said was, despite all of the evidence, <laughs> despite all of the evidence, despite all of the evidence, now this, despite all the evidence, she's saying, yeah, despite all the evidence, in other words, saying that there's no evidence that this is flat. They're, they're, they hold on to the same rhetoric, the same narrative every single time. And next time, don't have the, remember yesterday I said Don Henley said it, the bubble-headed bleach blonde comes on at five. She can tell you about the plane crash with the dream in her eye. Remember that? Well, guess what? Last night she was a brunette. <laughs> Still a beautiful woman, but she wasn't here. Disconnection. So it's proof right there. Come on, you're not even, the person that's telling you the story is not even involved. There you go. I agree. I agree 100%. I would not. You've got the confidence to speak up at a flat earth rally. I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> That's for sure. But I just want to say again, it's been a blessing um, coming down here. It's been a blessing being a part of this. And I just, uh, I can't wait for today. I'm really excited about it. I really am. And I've gotten to know a lot of you, uh, genuine people and just, Phenomenal. And I, uh, I told my wife again this morning, I said, it's just such a blessing. It really is to see this. You guys are killing me at this thing. So I do want to say, was that for me, John? Are you trying to get me to get keep going? Okay. Okay. Thank you. But I, I can say this though. I, I hope that when we all leave here, um, 
that this is something that you guys will cherish and remember because this is the first one. And I can tease that there's going to be more. And I hope to see all your faces. And I hope that uh, as you go back, that you share your experience with others and you tell them, you know, the type of people you met here and how real and humble and just almost like family. That's what it is. I haven't met one stranger since I've been here. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. It's been a great experience. And I'm not getting preachy. This isn't Sunday morning. But I will say this. I do believe God's got his hand on this entire group. I really do. Well, he's got his hand on everything, but yes. It's, it's very special. And I look down here, and as I look down, I see the Bible right in front of me. So obviously, Pastor Dean is around here somewhere. And this is a guy, I'm going to bring him up. Is that cool, Robbie? Is there anything else you want me to hit, brother? We're all good? All right, cool. Pastor Dean was a guy that I came across probably about, I'd say, eight months ago. And just started watching him and watching his delivery and hearing him speak. And it's got that draw, a little bit of a draw. Which reminds me of my papa. My grandpa was Southern. And um, you can see a, a person's character in their eyes. You can see who they are in their delivery and their sincerity. And uh, this is a guy that I know God is using in many facets. And um, I just want to bring up on stage, Pastor Dean, come up here, man. I'm excited to hear you speak. And he's going to be speaking for a while. You were scheduled to go like 45 minutes or, or about an hour. You're, you're gonna, we're going to make him go longer because he's got enough material and I just want to say, uh, God bless you, man. God bless you. Thank Thanks for having us. Hello. Do you have a dog with someone you're talking to? <laughs> Pastor Dean. Uh, and, uh, thank you. Thank God. Hallelujah. Let me find this clicker here. All right. Do I start it or do you start the first one? All right. We'll go ahead and get that up there. I know. Everybody's going to get a good laugh today because I have, uh, you're going to see the progression of it leaving over the years. Uh, but uh, I'm happy about it now. I have, I don't have to get haircuts and I don't have to uh, shampoo or anything like that. I just shave this when I shave this. So I'm good. Um, this morning, I just want to say uh, thanks to everyone, to Robbie, uh, to everyone that's worked so hard uh, on this conference. Um, I know, as Rick said just a moment ago, that the truly the hand of God is upon this, uh, regardless of what you believe or where you are in your journey of faith. Uh, for some of you, Flat Earth has been uh, a journey back toward God, back toward the Creator. For me, my journey started a long time ago. It started really in 1979 when I was 11 years old. And... Um, and this revelation of the flat earth, and, and one thing I have to say, I've studied the Bible intensely uh, for 30 years of ministry. And one thing I have learned is that you always have more to learn and you always have more to grow. And when we ever start thinking that we have it all figured out, uh, then we're in trouble. I mean, there's certain foundational truths that uh, whether it be in scripture or certain truths about, you know, flat earth. I mean, we may, we may have all these uh, questions about how the sun works, but one thing we know we can all be settled on is we've, uh, we've seen enough evidence uh, to know that it's flat. And uh, I'm gonna share some of the, our evidence that we went out and tested as well. But uh, this morning, um, I'm not gonna cover again the ground that uh, Rob, Skiba covered, he, he did an excellent job covering uh, the, just, just going through the Bible. And truly the Bible is a flat earth book. Um, I have to admit that when the Holy Spirit came over me and I saw my first video, thanks to Scrawny DeBrawny and a, a true Christian brother that lived in Hollywood, sent it to me and said, hey, watch this and tell me what you think. And um, the Lord had given me a revelation about two months before 
that video came, the Lord spoke to me. And, I'm, and when I say Lord, I'm speaking of Jesus Christ. So uh, that'll be evident in a minute. Um, but the Holy Spirit told me, he said, I have something else to show you. And it's big. And I want to say this to, at the outset of this. Two things. Number one, if there wasn't concrete evidence to this, observable concrete evidence to this, and if it wasn't clearly in the scriptures, I would not be here. I would not jeopardize 30 years of ministry, people that I have led to the Lord and that are our pastors today. I wouldn't jeopardize my uh, ministry or reputation or anything for, of that matter, no matter how big or small it may be, I wouldn't jeopardize that. Um, I'm telling you today and the media and everybody else, you can mock, you can ridicule, you can scoff, but there is concrete evidence. And not just, it's not just a religious thing. It's not just the Bible thing. It's concrete evidence. There's mathematical evidence, visual evidence, visual proof that there is no curvature. We know the government has lied to us. Amen. It is so obvious when you look at NASA footage and, and I've gone through not just the documentaries, not just uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the moon uh, or, you know, NASA mooned America or, or, <laughs> or we never went to the moon. I've read all of those things, I've uh, all of that. Um, but I've gone through NASA videos and pictures on their site and it's just, it's obvious. Come on. I mean, it really is. Once you start paying attention, it's obvious that they have lied. They have deceived us. They have done all sorts of things. And should it be a shock? I'm going to show you from the scriptures, 2000, 3000 year old prophecies that foretold this conspiracy. It's one thing that they talk about the, the press and say, oh, there's a bunch of conspiracy theorists. No, there's con conspiracy theory and then there's conspiracy fact. Yeah. <laughs> and the Bible foretold a global conspiracy that specifically would hide the truth of creation, that would hide the creator, particularly the creator of the Bible, Yahweh, Elohim, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that is the Bible foretold that. And I want to say too, at the outset here, you know, we talk about how that, that there's the domed flat cosmology in different cultures, uh, Norse, uh, Navajo, um, Hindu, and all of that's, you know, the, I believe all of them had a, a little whisper of the truth. But the thing that makes the Bible different, the reason we can identify the God that they're trying to hide from us is because he foretold it all in great specifics that it would happen. And I know some of you may have problems with different aspects of the, of the scriptures that you don't understand, or you think were too harsh, or you think are this or that. But uh, again, it's one of those things we have to go back to. I tell people, quit worrying about what you don't understand and let's get back to the foundation. Let's get back to the basics. There is one God. His name, he has many names. He has Yahweh Elohim, El Shaddai. But the Bible says that the name that is above every name is the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that is it. It is not Buddha. It is not Krishna. It is not Allah. It is Jesus. And so I'm all about Jesus. And that's what, you know, I'm going to share a little bit because a lot of people don't know uh, my testimony, but going back um, 1979, this is Northside Baptist Church in Opelika, Alabama, a little Baptist church that my dad took me to, my dad and mom, when probably about the started about the time I was 10. And the reason I want to show this is I want to show you that uh, Jesus can reveal himself to you if you don't know him. And I was 11 years old. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know really anything about him. Not a whole lot at all. But it's more than just learning knowledge about him. It was in this little church. And even though we'd been there for about a, a year, 
there was one particular uh, service where I was sitting in the back pew, normally passing notes and talking with my friends and not paying attention to the pastor whatsoever, usually getting in trouble with my dad when I got home from church. Um, but there was one particular morning that the presence of God began to work on me. I can't tell you what the pastor said. I don't even know what he preached that way. I couldn't tell you. I just know that the Holy Spirit of Almighty God came upon me. And at 11 years old, he revealed to me that I was a sinner and that I, that there was a heaven and a hell, that there was an eternal destiny in one of those two places and that I needed my sins forgiven. And the way to do that was to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for my sins and he rose from the dead the third day and that I had to ask him to forgive me and to be my Lord and Savior to change my life. And that day, I'm going to tell you, I sat back there and the presence of God was all this 11 year old kid. I was crying, shaking. It wasn't a man. Can, you know, it wasn't fear. It was this tremendous revelation of truth by the spirit. And when I got up, I was sitting in the very back of the, of the back pew. When I got up and walked down that aisle, I have never felt more intense power peace, love, joy. It was so overwhelming, the presence of Jesus Christ. I don't remember walking from the back to the front. I don't even remember what I prayed when I prayed with the pastor. But that day I was truly, biblically, John 3, when Jesus said, you must be born again. I was born again and it was... Um, it was something I'll never forget. So I want to say this to those of you out there. There's a lot of people negative on church today. And listen, this little church had problems. They had a lot of problems. They ended up, you know, causing a problem with my dad that hurt him for many years. But I want to tell you this. I'm thankful that my dad took us to that church. Because even in an imperfect church, God touched my dad, me, my brother, my sister. It was a powerful, powerful experience. So... Don't be negative about church. There's bad ones. There's good ones. But God works in imperfect places and imperfect people. Right. Um, like many of us, a lot of us have the same story. After that, my parents divorced. And I went through, uh, you know, not going to church and not really learning what it means to follow Jesus. And so, you know, I became a partying, immoral, sexually immoral, pretty much a, an alcoholic as a teenager and, a, and just drugs and the whole nine yards. Uh, that's me, believe it or not, and my roommate at Troy State University back in 1987 in an air band contest so drunk that I can't believe we can even still stand up. We got disqualified from an air band contest <laughs> because because we were, uh, we were that drunk. I had goals to play football at Troy. I had blown out my knee in high school and had knee surgery. And I was, that was my plan. I was going to play football, but, uh, and uh, you know, I just got to, I was just living a wild life. I was in Sigma Chi fraternity and we were partying every single day and just drinking, drinking drugs. Just, it was just insane. But, uh, little did I know that I'd shut God out of my life. Not that I didn't believe anymore, but I was just living uh, for the world completely. And uh, about that time, yeah, believe it or not, he had hair. Right? <laughs> it did exist. Uh, but in uh, 1986, a crazy thing happened. Door opened. Um, my girlfriend at the time convinced me to go to a modeling agency, a big one in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, they signed me. And right after that, I had a screen test for All My Children, One Life to Live, all the soap operas and that stuff. Uh, uh, this agency, they had worked with Don Johnson and some of the other big ones in the 80s. And uh, right after I did the screen test, I was I got a phone call that uh, they had me a part in Die Hard 1. Um, 
Believe it or not, I didn't know, even know. And they said, all I knew was Bruce Willis was going to be in it. And of course, who knows? It's interesting. I found this last night. There's no 9 11 Illuminati symbols going on there, is it? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Going back to 1988, well, the movie came out in 88, but this was about the time that uh, that God began to get a hold of me again. And um, I was partying so much. And that I just knew I needed to get away and that I was going to ruin this career. I was making $200 an hour in the modeling and about to be rich and famous. They, they had more parts and everything, right? Everything was, everything was happening, but I was getting more and more depressed. I was getting more and more down and I couldn't understand it. And I just thought, well, I'm going to get my act together. I'm going to quit drinking, quit doing drugs, quit, you know, chasing women all over the place. And I'm going to get my act together. And uh, I didn't know what I was saying, but long story short, I go away for the summer to Arkansas. And that's when I had a guy finally talk to me about Jesus. Finally got back in my bed. No one talked to me about, it, about the Lord in seven years. And somebody got in my face finally and said, you know what? The Bible's clear. Galatians 5, you cannot be a drunkard and enter the kingdom of heaven. A habitual drunkard. And I said, I didn't know that. And he showed it to me. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit came back that I remember. And long story short, I, I was just praying. I, I was under conviction. I was just like, what am I going to do? I've got this. I can have everything the world has to offer or, or, or surrender my life. And that's what I put up here on the screen. The first time I ever heard God speak to me in my spirit, and I believe God speaks, still speaks. He's not dead. He's alive, folks. He still talked to you. Amen. Problem is a lot of times we're not listening. And he said these words to me. He said, son, you can have everything the world has to offer and go to hell or you can surrender your life to me and live forever. Now, for a lot of people, when you start talking about hell, that's not too popular. But I'm going to tell you what is the truth of the Bible. It's the truth of God Almighty. And it's the truth that woke me up again and brought me to real repentance and real faith again. And so at 19 years old, I repented. And repent means you stop living in sexual immorality. You stop doing drugs. You stop. And I stopped and I gave my life to Jesus. And I said, Lord, I'm going with you or I'm not going at all. I said, I will not be a hypocrite. Now, I'm not going to say I've lived perfect since then or I never sinned again, but it was clear. I gave him everything. And I think that's a lot of, of, of what's missing. And I, I and I'm going to get to all this, but I do want to say this flat earth the truth of flat earth won't save you. It won't wash your sins away. It won't give you eternal life. It won't, it won't open a door for you into heaven. It's a great revelation. It's a great truth. It's liberating when you get free from the lies. This was kind of, for me, this was the final lie. I knew the truth about 9-11. I knew the truth about the Illuminati, the New World Order, the world government. I know, I know Bible prophecy really well. And I was, I'm, I've been watching it happen in the world for the last 30 years. But this was the final lie. This was the, one of the big ones. And, and when it lifted off of me, it was wonderful. But it's not the end all, folks. It's not the end. Of the, it's, it's just, for some of you, it's a beginning, but it's a good beginning. If you go the next steps you need to go. And that's, that's why I'm here today. Now this, I, I shared this because I want you to understand that when I talk about Jesus, I'm not talking about just a theological creed or something that you just choose to believe or a religion. I'm talking about someone you can know personally, intimately, powerfully, someone who still speaks to you. He promised in the last days, and I believe we're living in those, and I'll show you that in a minute too. I believe that he said real clearly that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh, your sons and daughters would prophesy, your young men would see visions, your old men would dream dreams. The God of creation, the creator, the God of the Bible, he's still supernatural. A lot of the church has shut that part out. And that's why a lot of us don't want to be in those churches. Because they've shut out not only truth, a lot of truth that they that's in the Bible and going on in the world, but they've uh, they've shut out that God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can still heal. He can still deliver. He can still 
change your life. And so in 1987, he gave me, uh, he opened heaven. I saw heavens open. I've had a vision of Jesus standing in heaven. And he called me to preach. And I, and I say that because I know that I'm here today talking to you, the media, the world, not just because of flat earth, but because the Lord called me and he showed me this was going to happen decades ago, decades ago. So you are in something, whether you know it or not, you are in a move of God. Just let him move you all the way. Amen. Um, I wanted to share this because this is something that I think Scientism Exposed is going to touch on a little bit too here. 1987, right after I rededicated my life to the Lord, um, my first convert was a, a witch. She was in line to be the high priestess of a satanic coven. And uh, her and her coven had been trying to curse me and kill me and all kinds of stuff. And I know it sounds crazy, but she finally came. She said, we know you're a true Christian because we have tried to kill you and we can't. She said, I want out of this. So she got saved. And then after that, of course, the demons came out, had to cast demons out of her. And then one day we're having a Bible study. You know what we did? We we're crazy. I'm 19 years old. I know nothing. Right. Where do we start? Genesis. So we're going down through Genesis and we get to this. And in 1987, before the Internet, before conspiracy theories were everywhere. Right. This girl who was high up in the occult, her, her dad was like over a big region of the United States. He was a high priest of a satanic coven. And she knew things. She would tell me things before they happened. She told me about Jimmy Swaggart before it came out. She said, it's, he's going to be exposed and this is what's going on. She told me all before it happened. They knew. Um, but we're reading Genesis 6 about the giants, the half-breeds, the Nephilim. Many of you know about what that is. The fallen angels with human women created this breed of giants. And, and then they had different, you know, there was just this genetic attack on the human race by Satan and his fallen angels. Well, she told me in 1987, she said, we read this passage in Genesis. She said, you know that these giants and these half-breeds, you know, they exist. And I said, really? She said, yeah, they're kept underground until the very end of the tribulation period. Well, she knew this. This is 1987. She told me this and I've shared this for years. So I want you to see, and the reason I share this is because God very early on started preparing me for the things that we'd be dealing with now, because this, this, this is where we're headed into the lie, the alien lie that is coming and why they have pushed this heliocentric, vast space lie on us. And NASA, you know, you know, astronauts leaking that they saw aliens, you know, or they saw spaceships or stuff. That's all on purpose. It's all part of the agenda. And so if anyone, listen, if anyone believes that uh, these aliens are really extraterrestrials from other planets, you, you got to get set free because uh, this is fallen angels and their offspring. And the plan is through NASA and space agencies and astronauts to bring this upon us so that the world will accept them and accept the coming world government, the coming world leader, the Antichrist, and the mark of the beast. And this is the ultimate. Listen, flat earth is big, but it is not the end goal for Satan. It is part of the plan. It's only part of the deception. But the deception is to finally get you to deny Jesus Christ, to accept the world government to accept the mark of the beast and to, to basically damn yourself to an eternity in hell by rejecting the God of the Bible, rejecting Jesus. This is the, this is the ultimate goal of all of this. Um, okay. There we go. So that's just, I'll just to show you a little bit. Yes. Yeah, see, notice the progression. I'm hair gone, but that's me preaching in Nigeria in 2002. 
this is what I, I've been I've been around a little bit. This is uh, new, and here is this. You know, I, I wanted to say this and make this. You know, of course, when I first heard the term flat Earth, I I thought it was ridiculous. My wife said a friend of hers. This was this was years ago. This was probably two thousand eight. A friend of hers, and I won't say who it was, but worked for a law enforcement agency and uh, kind of a high up in a state agency, and said the earth was flat. I thought, what? I think she lost her mind. <laughs> I thought, wow. I, I thought that she she must oh, hello. She must not uh, she must not have it all together or something. I just thought it was silly. And I dismissed it. So that's 2008. That's kind of the first time I heard it. But uh, you know, I, was, I thought, is, it, is flat earth just another crazy conspiracy theory by a bunch of paranoid people who feel too much fake news? Uh, you know, and that's kind of where the, a lot of the media want to come from. Uh, and then, of course, with me being a pastor, being a Christian, it's always just a Bible thing with him. It's just a religious thing. Um, they, you know, we're a bunch of religious nuts that ignore science or real science. But uh, again, none of that's true because, uh, you know, even I was indoctrinated. I'm, I have to say I was ashamed that I didn't believe this sooner because I read the Bible over and over, studied it. I saw he engraved a circle, Proverbs 8, engraved a circle upon the face of the deep. I read the terms, the ends of the earth, again and again and again. <laughs> you know, I read the terms about the four corners of the earth. And uh, I mean, I read all that. I, I, I just like, you know, and, and the sun moving and the sun running its race, Psalm 19 and all of that. And yet, because of that public school and university indoctrination, I just... I was blinded to it, couldn't see it. I, I remember when, my, when God did open my eyes, I had to just repent. How did, how did I not believe? I, believe? I believe the rest of the Bible. I believe it all from Genesis to Revelation. How did I miss this? But this is strong. And this is something I want to say to everyone here and everyone watching. Remember, don't get impatient with people that don't, that don't see this just yet. Family, friends, coworkers. Um, remember, you didn't see it either. You know, it took a, it, it took some, something had to happen in your life. But I tell you what, though, God's going to use this in a big way. Of course, we've all seen this, but it's really true that from, from a child, if we, we keep that, they kept pushing that ball in our brains, uh, that that's what we thought it was. But um, um, this is the reality, isn't it? Now, what I want to share with you now for just a few minutes is what convinced me. And I want the media to hear this. I want everybody to hear this. Here, I'm a pastor. I am a Bible believer. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of, of being a Christian. Um, but I'm going to tell you that I didn't come to this flat earth truth because just because of the Bible. In fact, if it hadn't been for evidence like this, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be talking to you. I wouldn't be preaching like I'm preaching. But I want to tell you, this stuff right here, high altitude balloon footage, we've all seen it. But this is without the fake curve created by these fisheye lenses and cameras. When I begin to see this, 108,000 feet, 121,000 feet, when I begin to see this kind of stuff right here, I was like, man, this is, this is for real, folks. This can't be ignored. I get sick of the, the, the media folks that want to ignore this. They don't want to put this on the news. They don't want to put these pictures. They want to put the GoPro pictures on the news. Right. But when you start looking at this, and I want to say too, and I'm going to share with you something I just saw recently. But of course, I've been looking at some, at, at U2 flies at 70,000 feet, the U2 spy plane. Right there, it is Lockheed Martin's specification: seventy thousand feet ceiling. All right now, here's the pilot's reflection in the U-2 spy plane. Look at that! Look at that massive curve in his the reflection of his visor at seventy thousand feet. Look at that! Really, that much curve, huh? And yet, the very next frame, they, the, there's a frame right here where they they switch to this, and all of a sudden you see them cut, and then they put that up. And I'm like, yeah, listen, they're manipulating this stuff right here. 
even the U-2 spy plane. And remember, the U-2 spy plane was a CIA program. Remember that. Of course, the Blackbird. I'm going to share something that just went, went viral recently. Anybody see this? Major Brian Shule, the SR-71 pilot, tells the LA Speed story. Everybody seen this? Heard this? Kind of went, it went viral on uh, the internet, just crazy. I mean, millions, millions of views. And he's telling this story, and I'm watching the little video. And he was a, he, he liked to take the camera on board, you know. He was the pilot, and he had a radio guy. And he'd like to take pictures of it, and he talks about that. Well, this is one of the pictures you get, right, out of his cockpit. Now, some of these I actually believe are simulators. That's just my opinion. I think some of it is. But it, it's amazing that this is what he's showing you he's looking at, right? And then it switches to this picture of him. You see what his visor's showing? That's at 89,000 or 80-something thousand feet. They forgot, they forgot to correct that. And I, this is on Facebook. This is on YouTube. I mean, this is everywhere. But it, the propaganda is what I'm getting at is this is just more manipulated propaganda to try to put a curve on this earth that God created that's flat. And look, there it is. That's, 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 that's a lot different <laughs> than, than this one. I actually think that little screen that they have up there is what's broadcasting that onto his thing, but that's just me. And again, there's 121,000 feet balloon, no GoPro lens, and we've all seen this. But I wanted, I'm sharing, this is what convinced me. I'm a pastor. I needed more. I wanted to have physical proof. Listen, the Bible says this, 1 Thessalonians, I have it open to this, 1 Thessalonians 5 Verse 21 says this, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Everybody thinks Christians just blindly follow anything, right? But no, the Bible says prove all things, test all things, prove it, make sure. So that's what we did, right? So did I go to just YouTube videos? No, I went to NASA's website. This is, this is from space.com. These are NASA pictures. This is pathetic. Press put this on the news, that, right there. If you can't see, we have a problem, right? So I begin to see this, and I don't like liars, because I know who the father of liars is. That's Satan, the devil. So liars who are doing stuff like this on purpose kind of lets me know they're in league with the liar, right? Of course, we've all seen this, the shadows. Of course, I I didn't believe the moon landed. And I want to say this because you know what? Thank God, when I was a kid, I saw Capricorn 1. I, really, I saw it like right after it came out because my dad got, had HBO right when it came out. So Capricorn 1, they were playing Capricorn 1 on HBO over and over and over again. I wasn't supposed to be watching it, but, you know, when dad wasn't home, I was... <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had the HBO and I watched Cap and I was like, yeah, that's what they did. I know that's what they did. Um, but of course, shadows going in different directions. I mean, no blast crater. That's supposed to be in front of the object, not behind it. There's fo photographic manipulation everywhere. I mean, and I've gone to NASA's website and looked it up myself. Now, this was a, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. Uh, I mean, they, they tried to doctor that one and put it back in right. You can tell it's darker than the other ones. Um, crazy stuff. They drew the line across his leg because it goes behind it in the real picture. And of course, to me, and everybody knows this, the smoking gun is what Bart Sabrell, the footage he got. Somebody leaked from NASA of the Apollo 11 crew faking the picture of the Earth through the circular window. I mean... I'm waiting for the news crew to play just that 10 minute snippet and go, this is why people like us have a problem believing NASA or the government or the European Space Agency or whoever, the Chinese. This is why, because they do lie. And of course, now what? All the Apollo footage is gone. 
They destroyed it, lost it, whatever. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. That one gets me right there, though. 10,000 pound thrust engine to land in, 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 there's no crater under it. There's no dust on this. It, it's a movie set, folks, and we know it. It's a movie set. And then I began to see the videos and the pictures. And then I began to, I took some pictures myself. We saw it coming back from Birmingham one time. The clouds behind the sun. We've all seen that. Of course, some people say it's overexposure. And then so you put a negative filter on it. And what do you get? It's not overexposure. Um, the sun is smaller. It's not far away. It's just what the Bible always said. That it's close. It's moving in a circuit above us. Just some more flat earth photography. I don't even know who this person is, but you do good work. Um, of course, the the famous one, it's it's not 93 million miles away. I mean, this is stuff you can view, you can see, you can do yourself. Do they put that on the news? We'll see. Huh? Interesting scripture from the book of Job, known by most theologians, one of the oldest books in the Bible. It says, now men see not the bright light or the sun, which is in the clouds. It's telling you, it's in the clouds. I don't even believe the 3,000 mile thing at all anyway, either. Uh, I'm not condemning if you were, I think we don't, a lot of it, we don't know a lot of things, but we, we got a lot to learn. Of course, this is one of the things that convinced me as a pastor. I see this and I begin to realize these distances aren't working. You know, you just don't think about it because most, most of us don't fool with math after we leave school. You know what I mean? And especially not this kind of math, right? So it's like, Okay, yeah, I remember I remember being on the island of Mauritius. I was preaching there in 2000. And I remember at night on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean being able to see the other island, Reunion Island, the lights from there. And it's 140 miles or so away. And I didn't think about that. And I remember watching the sunset in the southern hemisphere, right? And I'm watching the sunset and all of a sudden you can watch our sunset go down and it takes a while as it disappears you're, you're you're down there and it's turning away from you go it, i couldn't even get my camera out of the bag to get the shots i wanted to get before the sun was gone so i even noticed in 2000 I said, there's something different going on down here um so as you should you say well that's, that's just a picture that's just something you saw on the internet it's just a conspiracy theory right it was a mirage yeah, this guy. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, he's famous for the wrong thing. Isn't he? But this is, I saw this and I'm just, I'm like, wow. And then of course I'd look up my, my own pictures and this is what mirages look like. Somebody mentioned them yesterday. Um, but there they are. Reflections off atmosphere above, inverted, upside down. And of course, here's the math. Um, and I'm bringing this up because we went and did our own test. Some of you know that, uh, me and one of my elders in my church, Kevin Wilkinson, uh, went and, uh, an engineer joined us. He graduated from Louisiana state university. We forgave him for that. <laughs> Auburn tigers and LSU tigers. We don't always get along. Um, but he, uh, 30 year engineer, he did the math himself. And he verified the experiment. We took a P900, Nikon P900, and an Orion telescope, and we went to Mobile Bay. Well, let me back up. This is eight inches times mile squared. So, you know, I'm not just taking videos. Even though I, I watched Jaronism, and I, uh, before we went and did this, I, we watched, you know, and I appreciated that. I got a lot from his stuff. I watched Rob's stuff and uh, a lot of different people's stuff. But you know what I did? I was like, we're going we're gonna to go out and do what this says, prove all things. Hold fast to that. So let's do it ourselves, right? So we went to uh, Mobile, Alabama, which I live in Auburn, Alabama. So it's about three and a half, four hours. And you see those cranes over there that load those ships, Mobile Port. There is uh, in the bay, they... They do a lot of loading and unloading of ships. And so what we did, we went uh, on the east side of the bay 
and went down, drove down to Fairhope, Alabama, and took our telescope and the P900 and shot across, diagonal across the bay, which depending on what you're looking at, 12 and a half to 13 miles. We had, we were on North Park Beach in, in Fairhope, Alabama. So we had the, uh, we had the telescope about, I'd say about four feet, maybe three feet off the ground. We had the camera at about five feet off the ground. And so we, we had all that calculated in. So with the, the telescope, it should have been 75 feet of curvature blocking our view. With the camera, it should have been over 60 feet blocking our view. Um, here's the, where we did this. Uh, that's uh, on the middle picture. That's the engineer, Paul Kelly, who graduated from LSU. That's me in the middle and Kevin on the end. And that's us there on the beach. And... There's, uh, there's the miles, 12 point whatever, to that spot. That's just the estimation. There's the, the curvature calculator. But again, our engineer did it himself. We didn't even have to use this. Uh, and here's the pictures, the actual photographs from 12 and a half to 13 miles. What do you guys see? Does that look like atmospheric lensing? Does that look like a mirage? No, what that is right there is a boat sitting in the water. <laughs> that 60 feet of earth curvature should be hiding from us. Right? It's not, there it is. The loading cranes you saw in the first picture, there they are, all the way to the, where they sit on the ground. 12 to 13 miles. There's a picture of them up close. You, it's hard to see on the right bottom there, but that's a ship being loaded. Notice you can see the colors on the, on the from the long distance pictures, you can see the, the red and the white on the top of the crane. See it? Look at that. those are the small cranes. You see them all the way to the ground. There they are. It's what they look like up close. Shouldn't even be able. You might. You might should be able to see just the top of them sticking up. Oh, this is this is proof to me. This is evidence to me. Everybody agree? Would everybody agree with that? Now I know this may be a bit redundant because all of us have looked at that, but but some of those people out there, they haven't seen. It. And I wanted to show this because I wanted, I wanted everybody, it's not just a religious thing. It's not just a denying of science or the scientist or the physicist or the, I love the theoretical physicist. What, what is that? Right? That's uh, what, you, what that is, is the high priest of a religion is what that is. All right. Um, but this is not a theory. This is not a guess. Now, folks, when, when, you go out and you can see something like this. There's a boat. Again, you, you can almost read. You can almost see the, the little things on top of it in great details. This is just not. But there it is sitting in the water. And we zoomed in a little bit. But this is April 2016. I found out one thing. It's hard to do this when it's warm, though. It's just too much. Uh, yeah, there's too much in the atmosphere going on there. But where's the curvature? Where is it? So see, here's the thing. We can, we can have all these discussions about how the sun works or how the moon works or all these different things. But I just keep coming back to this one thing. I can't find curvature. And if there's no curve, then every picture we've, been, we've seen from these people, from these governments, claiming to be from space are fake. And then we find out they are fake. They are, right, Photoshop. They are composites. So again, we find out. Now I want to share this right after all of this. The Frick family in my church, he's a, Paul is another elder of mine. His kids saw this commercial. And I want to say that the children have grabbed a hold of this man. Once I started preaching and teaching on this, it is like something came alive in them 
about God, about the Bible, about creation. They just got so excited. So this commercial comes on. Everybody knows what it is now. But back then, I, had, I haven't seen it. I didn't know who August Picard was. So they come to church one Sunday and say, Pastor Dean, you've got to see this commercial. It was the, it was the firmament. And it went into water. They were, just, they were just excited. I'm like, what are they talking about? So then I watched the commercial. And, you know, everybody knows about it now. 51,000 feet. So I find out that this is not just a commercial. That was a shot in the commercial, by the way. I was like, hmm. They show us one with a curve. They show us one pretty flat. Why are they playing games? I wonder why they do, you know, sometimes why they expose themselves so, like this. Um, yeah, I agree. They have to. And there it goes once he reached the top, breaking into water. And of course, we know their spin on it was that he also explored underwater. But I didn't realize I'd never heard of this man. So I got home from church that day and I started looking up, finding out he's a real guy, PhD in physics, inventor. I knew anybody heard of him until all of this came out. I had never heard of him. I'm like, how did we not hear about this guy? So I got on there and I found out, I said, well, I found that he was, that this 10 miles high in a balloon was in this popular science magazine. So you know what I did? I said, I don't want to just see this on the internet. I'm going to see if I can find this magazine. So I got on the internet and went on eBay and I found one for $15. And I ordered it and it was there in a week. Shipping and all was $21.75, I think. The next time I saw it after I shared my first video on Flat Earth, I the opening bid for the next one was $3,500. <laughs> but this is the testimony of a scientist, pre-NASA, friends with Albert Einstein. He's the first man to reach that altitude, 51,000 feet, around the altitude, a little lower than the... Uh, um, Concord flu. And he said that looking through the portholes, the observers, him and his assistant, through the portholes, the observers saw the earth through a copper colored, then bluish haze. And they said it seemed a flat disc with an upturned edge. Are we crazy? How do you get a curve this one, out of an upturned edge? I, that's what he, that's what he said. This is in Popular Science Magazine, August 1931. They've come a long way, right? Took NASA to try to convince us differently. So I have the magazine. You know what, though? You know how when you leave home and you travel somewhere, you always forget one thing? I know I left it at home. Oh, well, I have it. I'll do another video, but there's a video with me. Then I came across this little gem. Anybody seen this? <laughs> I got this off of NASA's website. This is for, for the news out there. This is for the skeptics. This is a uh, NASA reference publication 1207. You can look it up. Matter of fact, press folks, why don't you, you Google it right now? All right? The derivation and definition of linear aircraft model. Now this is, means the derivation, the origin and the definition of basically how aircraft work, how they fly, how they work. A lot of trigonometry and calculus and math in this that I have long don't understand anymore. <laughs> but the summary in this and the conclusion of this says these, these words, this report documents the derivation and definition of linear aircraft model of a rigid aircraft of, of constant mass flying over a flat, non-rotating earth. He goes on to say this report details the development of a linear model of rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a flat, non-rotating earth. Now, let me ask you something. If 
the flat, if NASA knows that the flat, non-rotating uh, Earth is a myth like a unicorn, right? if that's what they think, it doesn't exist. They, they've proven that it's a ball flying through space, spinning. And Why would you even use those, those words? You know, I got a big argument with a guy that works for NASA, but he couldn't explain this. This is NASA document, reference publication 1207, 1988, signed in the back by Langley, Virginia, and uh, all the heads of NASA at the time. Let's, uh, let's read a little more here. This is the concluding remarks. You can see it signed by the, the head of NASA down there, January 8, 1987. This report derives and defines a set of linearized system matrices for a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating Earth. So somebody said, you know what? We actually have to design aircraft to fly over what's real. <laughs> right? Can you think about an aircraft trying to fly at Mach 1 or Mach 2 in a constant curve? What? It would come apart. And they know it. They know it. They know it. They know it. Right? Well, you see jet fighters screaming across just the top of the water. If it was curving, they wouldn't make it, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So what I'm getting at, I want you to see this as a pastor. I'm not here just because it's a Bible thing or a religious thing or some blind faith or some religious belief. I did what my Bible told me to do. Prove all things. Prove all things. Test all things. Hold fast to that which is good. And then you know what? For me, once I saw all this stuff, once I got back into the scriptures without the blinders of my public school education, once I got back in the Bible and just started reading it for what it said, guess what? My Bible agreed with all of this. Amen. And I thought, my Lord, you, you're ahead of us again. See, in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Now, does the Bible describe the shape of the earth? Does it say that it's flat? Well, I believe it does. And I'm going to show you what what God showed me. Now, one verse that came out immediately that I saw in a video was this one, but I did my research into the original Hebrew and studied this. Job 38, 14, the earth is turned, it, and he's speaking about the earth, the context of the chapter. In fact, he talks about in the beginning of the chapter, he asked Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? So the context of the chapter is creation. And then he says this, speaking of the earth, the, the earth is turned, not spinning, but the word in the in the Hebrew means to change, like you would change a potato into mashed potatoes. It's you you, you transform something, and that's why it says it's just, it is turned or changed like clay is to the seal or the signet ring, and they stand out as a garment. Well, you see the picture he's he's showing you there, clay to a signet ring. In those days, they would take a a piece of clay or a piece of of wax and they would pile it up and then it would be mashed down by the king's ring flat and it would have upturned edges right so that's the old testament picture and the verse i had in the slide before it said in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word shall be established so in the old testament he gives you this picture of the earth being like clay or wax pressed down flat and then one saturday night I was studying and reading my Bible and I was preparing for a message on the marriage supper of the lamb. And I came across another verse, but let's, well, let's do this first. I jumped ahead of myself, but these are some different translations of that verse. Uh, the complete Jewish Bible says the earth is changed like clay under the seal. 
until its colors are fixed like those of a garment. The Amplified Bible says the earth is changed like clay into which a seal is pressed and the things of the earth stand out like a multicolored garment. So oh yeah, it's, it's, the, the translation is correct about changed and about being pressed down by a signet or seal ring. Um, here's the one that, that really got me when I was studying. When I, I was not looking into flat earth, I wasn't studying flat earth, I wasn't preparing a message on creation or anything of that nature. I'm just getting to, ready to do one on Bible prophecy and the marriage supper of the Lamb of Jesus when he returns. And so I'm reading Revelation 20. And it's this verse is seven through nine here. It says, and when a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, of the four corners, actually, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed or surrounded the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever. Now I was reading this and this is how the, the Lord works. Remember, as I said, starting this out, we all have much to learn. I can't tell you how many times I've read this. Can't let me tell you, I've preached and spoken it out of my mouth. But this time, the Holy Spirit drew my attention to the work, the breadth of the earth. I said, why didn't he just say they went up on the earth? Why did he use the phrase, why? They went up on the breadth of the earth. So as I did for the first time, I can't tell you how many times I look up the Greek words and Hebrew words in the Bible. And I, so I looked this up, breadth. It is the word platos in Greek means width or breadth, but it's from the root word 4116 in the Strong's Greek dictionary. And that is the word platus, which means, look at there, spread out flat. It's really the root word we get plateau from, a flat plain. Um, here's the Blue Letter Bible, all the definitions, plateaus, platus. Plateau spread out flat to mold, basically flat. It's actually giving you the same picture as in Job 38 of clay being pressed down flat. Now, I've had some people come at me and said, oh, oh, you know, I get theologians upset with me sometimes. But I got a good theologian friend, Pastor, I mean, Dr. John Strazizich, and graduated PhD from Fuller Theological Seminary. And if I, if I feel like I'm, you know, somebody tells me, hey, you're out of line here, I would go back to Dr. John and say, hey, you're the Hebrew and Greek scholar. Am I wrong here? <laughs> Am I reading the definitions in these dictionaries wrong, you know? And of course, he, he lets me know I, I'm not. But uh, this right here, there were people that say, well, it just means flat land, not flat earth. Earth or earth, there just means flat land. It just happens to be an area where they went to flat, right? Except for the fact that in the Septuagint, this the Greek translation of the Old Testament that Ptolemy II, Philadelphia's ordered in 250 BC, used the word erets, right? For they translated that the same as this gay or gi. So it is the word earth. Meaning, and it's used over and over and over again for the whole earth, not just part of the earth. So when it says they went up on the earth, I tell people all the time, I said, really, you can literally translate that they went up on the flat earth. And that, to me, you have it, Old Testament, New Testament, two witnesses, is pretty clear. And there's the etymology of the word plateau. And look what it tells you. It tells you why, where it's from. I mean, it said from the Greek platus, which means flat. So guess what? Flat means flat. <laughs> so, and you know, it's interesting. I did a short video uh, just a little over, I guess it was a little over a year ago, called The Bible Does Say Flat Earth. I checked it yesterday. It has 551,000 views. And... Um, and a bunch of people have mirrored it and cloned it. Yeah. So I have no idea. But this is this is truth that is not being buried anymore. Amen. Amen.
Now I want to get to a little different part here, and I've got to I've got to do this quickly. I can't believe how how quick this is going by here. Um, but you know, we heard yesterday, and I appreciated what Jaron said, what Mark Sargent said. Um, seemed to everybody, Robbie. Everybody's on the page of the big reason of, okay, why are they, why are they lying to us? Why are they deceiving us? Why are they hiding this? And of course, the same thing I kept hearing, they're hiding God. They're hiding God from us. They're hiding the creator from us. And that's good. That's good that we get to that point, that we understand this is the goal. But we need to understand something. These other cultures, these other religions, Hindu, Norse, Mayan, Inca, Navajo, they had a basic understanding of, of the way God made creation, but they did not have the specifics. They did not have something else. They did not have the prophecies. And this is my point today. I'm here today to tell you that even though these other cultures, just like the, the flood story, no one, the flood story is in hundreds, it just hundreds of different, stories, then they have parts of the truth. But the Bible gives us the details. It tells you the literal man, Noah, his family, why, where, the details. That's why God took Moses up on that mountain, folks. He took him up on that mountain and God Almighty, the creator, came down on that mountain and said, look, people have distorted the stories. I'm gonna give you the way it is. The way I created the heavens and the earth, Adam and Eve, real people. I'm going to give you the whole story. Noah, his sons, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Nimrod, Babel, I'm going to give it all to you. The table of nations, listen, the table of nations in Genesis 10 has been proven absolutely accurate. Genesis is not a true myth as they teach in some seminaries. It is actual history. Accurate, given by God to man. So it is clear. Now, I, I want to bring this to the table here, folks. The Bible is unique. The Bible is unique and above all other religious sects for this reason. The Bible has more manuscript evidence than any 10 pieces of ancient literature. You don't understand that. Just of the New Testament, there's 24,000 copies or portions of the New Testament dating back to the first century BC, I mean AD. Then you have, you know, I mean, you, you compare that to Iliad by Homer, which only has 643 surviving manuscripts, but the New Testament, 24,000. So if you throw out the, the New Testament or you throw out the Bible, manuscripts and you throw it out as unreliable you got to throw out everything caesar's gallic wars you got to throw out uh, tacitus you have to throw out everything of ancient literature because they have much less manuscript evidence archaeological discoveries i just had to put these up because listen i could be here all day going through the archaeological uh, discoveries that have proven the bible to be correct Again and again and again, even through the years of, of, you know, textual criticism and all that. You still see. They would the, the, the critics would say, oh, the, this story is not true. The kingdom of David never existed. And then they find. The city of David or they find the, the stones that, that have David written on them in the kingdom. of David. So it's over and over. If, and listen, people talk about research on your own. You know, I love that what Jaron was talking about yesterday. Do your own research. I'm surprised at how many people condemn the Bible when they haven't checked out all the evidence. Don't don't fall into the same trap that you were in, before, you know, before you believed in the flat earth, condemning it before you researched it. Right. I've been doing, I've been researching this, and, I, and I'll say this, I would not believe the Bible is the word of God, that there is one true God, one true Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I wouldn't believe this, this book if I didn't know the proof, the evidence. That's why I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't believe flat earth if there wasn't proof and evidence. 
I wouldn't be. I wouldn't do this. I tell people, look, man. If there wasn't proof, if this, if all this wasn't true, man, I would just be living my life. You know, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, and there's nothing else after that, right? But because I know that I'm going to have to give an account to a Creator, to God, the One who made me, and that He has a standard that He wants me to live by. But that I can't keep that standard. Never can perfectly. So he came in the flesh. Died on the cross. To make a way for me. To be forgiven. To be cleansed. There's so much evidence. These are a few books. Evidence that demands a verdict by Josh McDowell. There's. There's. If you want to know, listen, if you're a skeptic out there or you're into Buddhism or Hinduism or whatever, or you're just, you know, a new ager and think it's about, you know, meditation and visualization and feelings of peace and joy. You need to know God's not confused. The creator's not confused. He didn't make 15 million different ways that contradict and, and go against one another to find him. He made one clear way. And if he's able to create this perfectly domed, flat, wonderful place, he was able to preserve a book that revealed what he wanted revealed. Amen. Now, I'm going to finish with this. The DNA. You know, when there's a crime scene, what do they want to find? They want to find DNA evidence, right? All right? We find DNA evidence of the criminal and track them down. And if we arrest somebody and we compare that, we got our man, right? Or woman. The Bible, and I'm not going to be able to go through all this, but the Bible has in the Old Testament over 300 prophecies concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ as God in the flesh, as Messiah, as Savior. Where he would be born, how he would be born, that his hands and feet would be pierced. Psalm 22 was written by King David 1000 BC, 3000 years ago, that his hands and his feet would be pierced. They would cast lots for his garments. Psalm 16, David wrote, he would, he would be raised from the dead. There is only one book that has that many prophecies concerning one man. There are no prophecies concerning Muhammad coming or Buddha coming or Krishna coming. The Bible is absolutely unique and you can go through them all. I encourage you, go do your research, right? 300. But I want to get at some things today about the Bible foretold, this right here is Psalm 2. Psalm 2, the Bible foretold 3,000 years ago. That in the last days, in the end, right before the wrath of God and the judgment of God, that there was a be a great conspiracy. That world leaders and world rulers would gather together and that conspiracy, that council would particularly be against the Lord, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and his anointed, his Christ, his Messiah, Jesus Christ. Listen, you want to tick people off? You can talk about God all day long. Just say his name, Jesus. That's what they don't want to hear. I'm going to read this. This is from the Amplified Bible because it just brings it out for you. But this is Psalm 2. And the Dead Sea Scrolls and everything proved that we had these prophecies long before they ever came to pass. Hundreds of years before any of them came to pass. It says, why are the nations in an uproar, in turmoil against God? Why do the people devise a vain and hopeless plot? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, Yahweh, and his anointed, the Davidic king, the Messiah, the Christ saying, let us break apart their, their divine bands of restraint and cast away their cords of control from us. 
But he who sits in the heavens or sits enthroned in the heavens laughs at their rebellion. The sovereign Lord scoffs at them and in supreme contempt, he mocks them. Then he will speak to them in his profound anger and terrify them with his displeasure saying, yet as for me, I have anointed and firmly installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain, and I will declare the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. This day I proclaim and have begotten you. He goes on to talk about the day of his wrath, about kissing the son, lest he be angry with you. This prophecy foretold that there would be a great conspiracy, that world leaders and world rulers and kings would take counsel together and that counsel would not be against Buddha. It would not be against Muhammad. It would not be against Allah. It would not be against Sin. It would not be against any of these other religions. It would be against the God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, to hide him from you. This is what they're against. This is what they hate. They want to keep you from Jesus Christ, finding him. That's what they want to keep you from. God said he created a firmament and there's waters above. God said that it's flat. God said there's an above and there's a below. God said there's a heaven above and a hell beneath. God said there is a judgment day where we will all give an account and that we better be sure that the blood of Jesus has washed our sins away and we've gotten serious with our creator. You know, you know I love Rob said last night very clearly, Rob Skiba made it clear, the Bible's a flat earth book, but I want to tell you something else. The Bible is a Jesus book. The Bible is a salvation book. The Bible is a way for it to have eternal life book. It's not just about flat earth. It's to give you the truth and the clarity in a world full of deception. Not just NASA's deception, not just government deception, but religious deception. Yeah. See, I want to tell you something. If you get the truth of flat earth, but you don't get the truth of Jesus Christ, you're going to miss it. You're going to be deceived by these Illuminati world rulers and this entire conspiracy, you're still going to be deceived. You're still going to miss the boat. It's the truth. The Bible foretold in the last days that there would be the uniting of kings to war against Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation chapter 17 he said there will be a beast with seven heads and ten horns. I will make that, I can make that very clear that that is the United Nations and where we're heading toward a world government. And the Bible tells you in, in we, we went to a prophecy in Psalms 3,000 years ago. This is Revelation 2,000 years ago. And he says the ten horns you saw are ten kings that have not received a kingdom, but for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb. That is Jesus Christ. But the lamb, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And with him will be his call and chosen and faithful followers. This is the war. It is a war not just over the true nature of creation. Or over our reality. It is over truth. And Jesus is the one. He said I am the way. The truth. And the life. Not a way. Not a truth. Not a suggestion. He said I am the way. The truth. And the life. No one will come to the Father but through. You cannot have God. You say oh I found the creator. I found God. But I, I, I don't know about Jesus. Okay. No. You can't, there's, there's no way, other way. I know that's not popular, but I'm not here to win a popularity contest. Because I tell you what, if they kill me tomorrow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a happy man. My wife wouldn't be. Like, 
But what I'm saying is I am going to stand before God and I'm not, I'm not going to have anybody's blood on my hands. I want to tell you the truth because I just want people to go to heaven. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I want you to be there with me. How, you know what? If you want people to be with you in heaven, how is that a bad thing? <laughs> but there's a bunch of people out there that don't even believe there's, that, that there's a hell. They don't believe there's an eternal punishment, an eternal separation. From God. And that's the cost. That's the cost of following Satan or following the lies, following deception, or just living for yourself, making yourself God. Some of you are making flat earth a God, an idol. Listen, and I'm not picking on you. Many preachers have made church and ministry an idol. You know, they, they come before come before Jesus. Here's the scripture where it says that these men, these evil people in the world, would withhold the truth of creation, even though God has shown it to them. Romans 1, 18, 22, 18 through 22, rather, and 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth. In unrighteousness. Now, in the Greek, the word hold can mean hold back or hold down, withhold or suppress. So these are men who hold or withhold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things from Him, uh, of Him rather, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, Godhead meaning Father, Son, Holy Spirit, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. So Part of the deception, he tells us, is to withhold the truth. And we know, just like I pointed out a minute ago, NASA knows it's flat. They know they're lying. They know it. They know they found the dome. They know they found it. But they don't want us to know. They're hiding it. But here again, did the Hindu scriptures tell us this? Did Buddhism tell us this would happen? Did even the Quran tell us this would happen? No. Oh boy. Oh boy. All right. All right. Hey. Hey. He is. Hey, excuse me, but I, no, no, we're getting it right on the right track it's supposed to be on. Amen. Get I, I, I And I acknowledge, hold on a second, I, hold on a second, okay, you've been talking. We acknowledge that other cultures and other religions have aspects of flat earth truth within them. We've already acknowledged that. I acknowledge that, okay? But the Quran also says, the Quran also says eight times denies that Jesus Christ is the son of God, denies him, 
and says that that if anyone anyone declares him to be God, strike them at the neck. Islam, Islam is a religion of death. It is Satan, is a religion of Satan. Simple. And the Bible did, listen, the Bible did foretell Islam. It did foretell Islam. The book of Revelation foretold Islam. It said there was a green horse. In the Greek, he says one of the horsemen of the apocalypse. He said that there, the King James says a pale horse, but in the Greek language, it is the chloros horse or the verdant green. The sacred color of Islam is green. It says in the last days that death would ride upon this green horse and hell would follow after it. And it said that one quarter of the earth, one quarter of the earth would be under the authority of this green horse. Right now, one quarter of the earth is Muslim under the authority of this demon called Allah. And, and Islam loves death. Islam preaches death. Islam loves death. The Quran preaches death. The Hadith preaches de preach death. I know about Islam. All right, all right, all right. Right. Last time I checked, you were not invited to speak here, but we let you speak. But we do not agree. All right. We love you. We hope you come to the truth of this matter. But we... I don't hate Muslims. I, I've said this many times. I don't hate Muslims. I don't hate Hindus or Buddhists. But I can disagree with them. And you know, here's the thing. I'm going to say this. If I was sitting here and somebody was up here saying the Quran teaches flat earth and Quran, I'd say, you know what? That's their belief. They want to have that belief. That's fine. But I got invited here as a Christian pastor. <laughs> you know? I'm not going to apologize for telling you the truth. Amen. Amen. All right. As there's just so much, even even within the, even within the Quran, it it admits that Jesus is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. It's it's quite amazing, and that's a whole other issue. But see, just like, I, and, and, I, and I was going to mention that, actually. I was going to mention how the Bible foretold the Quran. The Bible is very specific about what would happen in these last days. And look, I know that not everyone in the flat earth movement is a Christian. I know that. But you know what? Yeah. I'm sharing my story. You can accept it. You can reject it. I'm not. If you reject it, listen. I know where, I know Jaron, for instance, not a Christian. I love him. I love his stuff, you know, and I will, regardless of whether he ever uh, comes to Jesus or love, you know, or, or becomes a Christian or not. That's, that's irrelevant. I just, I want everybody, I want this, this dear lady here to come, you know, that's the truth. And see, and that's the difference. You know, I, I've been in Muslim countries. I've had my life threatened by Muslims. Um, I risked my life in Nigeria, Mauritius, in places where Muslims wanted to kill me. I've been on a plane with a bomb that Muslims put on a plane in Nigeria. So I've, I've been around a little bit. I've, I've spoken to Muslims. I was actually held in Nigeria at one point. <laughs> and uh, that one I didn't think I was going to get out of. And, uh, but I was with a Sudanese Muslim, very well-dressed you know, a uh, businessman. And I asked him, I said, you know, I said, is it wrong? I said, we, obviously we disagree. We talked a little bit about Christianity and Islam. I said, obviously disagree. I said, but can you agree on one thing? Can you agree it's wrong to kill over religious beliefs? And he looked me in the face and he said, no. 
I mean, the press puts it out one way. Oh, Muslim, uh, Islam is a religion of peace. I know there's some good people that are this, this grew up Muslim. They don't know anything different. But they're just trying to be good people. They're trying to raise their families. They're trying to do what's right. But when we get to what Muhammad did, what Muhammad taught, and what many of them followed in Muhammad's teaching, it's why we have what we have in this world. So anyway, I think we, yeah, we're, <laughs> that's all right. Hey, somebody had to get heckled before it was over. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's going to work. I'm trying to get, there we go. We'll just move on here. I was going to share some of this stuff with you, but we're running out of time. Yeah, did y'all know, y'all know the United States in the Bible? Babylon. Oh, no, not Babylon. We, we we came out of we came out of England. Look, there's four beasts. I'll, I'll do this real quick. Let's see if we can get this to work here. I'll just share this with you. We got just a few minutes. There's four beasts in the book of Daniel. I just wanted to show you specific: lion with eagle's wings, a bear. A leopard with four heads and two sets of wings, and then there's a dreadful beast with ten horns. Daniel 7, 17 says these, these four beasts are four kings or kingdoms which shall arise in the earth. Now, the traditional teaching on this is, of course, Babylon, Persia. But remember, at this time, Babylon had already fallen. Persia was in existence. This says shall arise, meaning in the future. So these are four kingdoms in the future that would arise. I believe that the lion, according to the symbols of England, their, lion, their symbol's always been a lion. It says the eagle's wings were plucked out of our symbols and eagle. Where did we come out of? Came out of England. Isn't it funny that that's Daniel 7, 4 as well? So July 4th, I found that just a funny coincidence there, right? Um, we know the bear's Russia. Can't get into it all now. Um, this one's interesting because it two sets of wings and four heads means a conglomerated beast or nations together. I believe it's the European Union for a reason. The two leaders of the European Union, Germany and France, their symbols are an eagle and a rooster, two sets of wings, four heads. It gets in a lot of stuff. So I, I, and I can't get into all this today, but I just wanted you to see something. We'll skip ahead. I'm running out of time here. Come on. Here we go. It symbols of Germany, the eagle, the leopard, the leopard tanks that all of the, most of all of the European armies have now come from Germany. They call them the leopard. The Bible is very specific, folks, is what I'm getting at. The prophecies, the things that are coming to pass. Well, it said these beasts would unite. Revelation 13, he said, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast you saw was like a leopard, and his feet is the feet of the bear, the mouth, the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his, uh, which is Satan, gave him his power, seat and great authority. It tells us these were nations in Daniel 4 in the book of Revelation, they would unite. What does that sound like? United Nations. Believe it or not, we know what George W. said, that uh, we were going to have a new world order. Credible United Nations would fulfill the promise of the vision of the UN founders. Guess what? The Security Council has five members. But now when they have a serious situation, they have the P5 plus one. They add Germany and they add the head of the European Union. So they have seven heads. When there's a critical situation and there's a revolving non-permanent members, there's 10 at all times. Seven heads, 10 horns, very specific. Our leaders have told us that the UN will eventually morph into a world government. The Bible has made that very clear. The, yep, and the and look at our, our beloved Walter Cronkite who believed the moon landing, or at least acted like he did said we must strengthen the United Nations as a first step toward a world government. 
Uh, Georgia congressman said the drive of the Rockefellers and their allies is to create a one world government combining super capitalism, communism under the same tent, all under their control. Do I mean a conspiracy? Yes, I do. I'm convinced there is such a plot, international in scope, generations old in planning, incredibly evil in intent. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because these same people are heading us in this direction. All of the deception is to get us to this point, and it is coming quickly. The mark of the beast. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, bond and free, to receive a mark of their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast. Now, I say this because think about this, folks. You want to compare the Bible to other religions? Quran, whatever. You want to compare it? 2,000 years ago, said in the end, a world government would be pushing something to be implanted in your head or in your hand to control all buying and selling. You want to tell me the Bible's the same as other religious books? I said earlier, prophecy, fulfilled prophecy, specific, detailed prophecy. It's the DNA of who the creator is. This is it right here. NASA and these people, this is where they're pushing us. Biochip implant. This is 2003. Biochip implant arrives for cashless transaction. Not too long ago, USA Today, after the company in Wisconsin pushed their employees to get chipped, USA Today writes this one, you will get chipped eventually. Well, I guess it's not going to work. I'm, I'll just finish with this. I, I'm going to be done anyway. I got I got one minute. I'm good. I want to say this. I love you guys. I love the Flat Earth community, and I love being a part of it. I know I'm strong and opinionated and bold, but I want you. To, I do want you to know. Um, I'm all in. Amen. I'm all in. And I believe God is using, I'm getting the testimonies, folks. I'm getting the testimonies, emails, comments, YouTube. I'm getting the testimonies of people saying, once I saw the truth of the flat earth, I saw the evidence. It brought me back to the Bible, brought me back to God. I've, I've had testimonies from people leaving the ancient alien lie, leaving atheism, leaving agnostic, leaving scientism, and, and coming back to looking at the scriptures and looking at God. And so I'm all in. I'm all for you. I don't care if you disagree with me. I still love you. Amen. Amen. God bless. So much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.